We are super excited that, uh, that you are with us here today on Mother's Day, and God just continues to seem to do a really sweet work of God uh, in this place and in this house. And something, something unique and beautiful is happening here at Trinity. It's hard to describe. It's a bit mysterious. But as we have kind of taken a step of obedience to figure out what it looks like to be two churches working together as one family on the same campus, it's like God, it's almost like he's, you know how you love when, when you're a father or a mother and you have these surprises that you're going to give to your kids but you haven't given to them yet? You like know how much it's going to bless them. And when the day comes when you can give them that kind of surprise, you're almost more giddy than they are. And then you watch them open it and you're like, oh, look, I, this is awesome. I lo-. You have this moment, right? I feel like that's how God is right now. Like he is just like, oh my goodness, I got more for you. Didn't you look, look at today, the adoptions. And, and look at the baptism, 17 people baptized last week. And, and, and when they combined, so yeah, give it up for that. Absolutely. And when we combine services and you were here for that, I mean, it's like, it's like this. He's the God of surprises. And he just loves to be like, I got more for you. I got, I got more for you. And that's just kind of the season that we feel like we've been in here at the Avenue Church. So if you're new here, man, just kind of get ready for the next surprise because God just keeps getting better and better. And we just want to invite you into the move of what God is doing here. And if you don't know anybody, you're new, make sure that you hang out for just a minute after service and try to connect with somebody around you and get a name maybe. And and those of you who are regulars, make sure you kind of look for who might be new and be able to connect with them so that they have have a space here in this family. So we, we are delighted that you are here. We're in week two of a series that we're walking through called Greater Empowerment. And basically, great, this, is, this is in conjunction with what we're calling Vision 2020. Vision 2020, expect greater things. Uh, Vision 2020 is all about seeing basically uh, the amount of Christ followers double over the next two years. That's what we're after. We are after seeing people who don't know Jesus come into the message that Austin shared and, and come alive in Christ through faith and repentance through giving themselves over to Jesus because he first gave himself over to him. And, and so that's, that's the core of Vision 2020. It is highly evangelistic and missional, okay? Because we believe that if you do evangelism, if you go after lost people with the same heart that the, that the prodigal God does, now you might be familiar with the prodigal son, but I love Tim Keller's book, The Prodigal God, the reckless love of God for us. If we recklessly go after the lost, listen, you get everything else. You get an amazing prayer culture. You get a culture that has to be in the Word. You get a a, a strong community because you need those things in order to invite the lost into something they don't have. And so we are just recklessly, as reckless as we can, going after the lost to see the amount for us, the amount of people that we baptize in believer baptism double over the next two years. And and this isn't just kind of like, oh, we thought this would be a good idea. This is what we feel like God has spoken into us from John 14. Um, Check this. I think we have this verse here, John 14, where it says, Jesus is making promises. He's a crazy promise maker. And he says, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. That's crazy. It gets worse or better, depending on how you're looking at it. And greater works than these will he do. And greater works because I am going to the Father. So here's the promise of Jesus. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and you're going to accomplish more as the body of Christ than I accomplished as it pertains to evangelism in my three years here. Like, you're going to revolutionize the world with the gospel. Those are the greater works we're believing for. And so we're just stepping into that as best we can. And we said here at the Avenue Church, if we're going to see the, the, the move, because we're a part of a, a greater move than just us. It's called Church United. And Church United has a five-year vision to see the 3% of Christ followers in South Florida move to 6%. We're like, hey, let's do our job over the next two years to join that. And so for us, we're looking for 200 baptisms. Like, that's what we're moving towards. That's what we're, we're, we're wanting to see because we've averaged about 50 people coming to faith in a year, and that's radically awesome. But we're believing for greater works. We're believing, so we've baptized 50 people, and you know, with, with baptism, some people are, are most of them are, are usually new to the faith, some are sort of like rededication, it's totally cool where you might be in that, but, but what we're hoping for is, is brand new believers who did not know Jesus coming into faith behind Jesus. And so we're, we're, we're working towards that, and we're doing all that we can to join the greater Church United movement that is in this area and happening 
right now. Other churches, uh, like-minded churches, are moving in the same direction. And so we are excited to be a part of that move right now, believing that Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit for just a time as this. And so if we're going to see that happen here at the Avenue Church, there has to be some cultural shifts for us. And we identified four of them, and we've been preaching through all four. We're on number three right now, and this is, we're, we're looking at a shift uh, as it pertains to empowerment. Empowerment. The first shift was a shift from attendance to expectation. Shift number two was a shift um, as it pertains to hospitality and, and moving from people we're normally hospitable to to being a bit more gospel, radical hospi hospitality. What does that look like? This is a shift right now where we're moving from ownership to empowerment. What does it look like not just to own sort of our ministry area, or what does it look like to not just kind of be in, in charge and give ourselves fully to this area, but what does it look like to actually become contagious? How do we duplicate and multiply gospel advancement by pouring into others, not just doing ministry, but equipping those around us for ministry? And so we're, we're walking through 2 Timothy to look at that. Verse by verse, we're in 2 Timothy, and that's where we're going to be over the next several weeks. And um, we, we've said, hey, listen, let's first of all define empowerment before we hop in and, and kind of get our hands around this idea. And so we have a definition from Cambridge uh, Dictionary here of empowerment. And it goes like this, the process of gaining freedom and power to do what you want. Now that might sound self-serving. I'm going to let it sit for just a second. Maybe some of you um, are thinking, well, I don't know how biblical that sounds, that we, we are going to let people do what they want. Didn't Jesus say to die to self and come follow me? And, and yes, awesome. You guys are reading your Bible, so you've got a question with that. That's super cool. If I ever say anything that happens to be a bit provocative and you think it goes outside the word of God, that should trigger something in your mind. Be like, what's he talking about? He better explain. I'm gonna. Here we go. Listen, the process of gaining freedom and power to do what you want. We believe, according to the promise of Christ, that when he left, if we're gonna do these greater works, we got someone. We got someone else besides Jesus. Who did we get? The Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of his believers, which is the promise for all believers when you come to faith in Christ, Austin gave that beautiful message, and he did it in like way shorter than I can, which is awesome. That was like really cool. He like gave the message in about like four minutes. It was great. When you come to faith in Christ's finished work, you actually um, get a new person to come and live within you, and it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has made your heart new, and the Holy Spirit actually gives you new desires. He, like, invades you, and he changes the way you think. He changes the way you talk. He changes your appetites. It's like you didn't used to like this, but now you slowly start to. Some things happen quickly. Some things happen over process. But you're a new person because the Holy Spirit has, like, jumped in, and he's like, this is my show now. Casey, you get to have the outer shell, but I'm running the show. And this is the cool part about doing what you want, because when the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, you actually want to do what Jesus wants you to do. Your, your appetite and your desires start to change. And so when I go home, I no longer want to just watch ESPN, eat Doritos, and go to sleep at like 11.30 in the midst of some meaningless playoff game. Here's what I want to do. I want to go find my wife and my kids and be like this explosively awesome dad. That's like what I want. I want to love my wife in such a way that she feels like she can flourish like she's never done before. When I come in here to this church, man, I want to be rid of the jail of self and be fully available to you. I have those desires. I need freedom and power to get to them. I need the freedom and power of the Holy Spirit to increase in my life so that I can activate the desires that I have. And so you know what that means? I need to walk in faith and my understanding of the Holy Spirit, but I also need people around me who are helping me to do that. That doesn't happen on my own. It happens in community. And thus this series is all about how, is, how do we as a culture begin to build a community where we start giving away freedom and power to one another so that we can do what we want. We can fulfill those godly desires that God has put in us through his Holy Spirit. Well, let's check it out. Second Timothy, beginning in, in chapter 1. 
This is where we'll pick up from last week. Last week, we talked about the elements of an empowering relationship. And this week, we're going we're gonna to shift a little bit into invitation. I want to be clear before we begin. What are we, what are we gearing towards? What are we gearing towards? We are not gearing towards, um, like, the best-behaved Christians. We are not gearing towards um, people who uh, know what it means to, to color inside the lines. We are not gearing towards really nice, sweet people. The word that we used last week and the word that will carry us through this whole series is the word disruptive. Disruptive. We are trying to empower those around us to be as disruptive for the gospel as they possibly can. Why? Because Jesus was radically disruptive. He was not what you would call a good boy in the sense of like always followed the religious elite's desires, always colored in the box that everyone told him to. I mean, this is the guy who, remember, who came in and flipped over tables. He not only flipped over tables literally, he flipped over tables systematically. He was like, your system is actually not enough. It points to me. All the sacrifices and stuff like that, it was pointing to me. So you can stop that because I'm going to a cross and I'm going to accomplish what all that was a shadow for by dying for sin and overcoming it through my resurrection. Okay, so Jesus was always disrupted. He was disrupting evil. When he would come into a room, right, and there were people ready with stones to throw them at the sinner, Jesus disrupted it. It was like, oh, dang, Jesus is here. We can't, we, can't, we can't, like, exercise our judgment. We love being judgmental. And when Jesus shows up, he ruins it. He, he ruined racism. He ruined uh, systematic equality. He ruined the way that people looked at women. It's like, man, I love looking at, this is the culture in the first century Judaism. Man, I love looking at women as objects and, and basically second-class citizens. And then Jesus shows up. He just disrupts the heck out of that. And he's like, no, 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 you know what? I'm going to, you know who I'm going to show the God? You know who I'm going to show the resurrection to first? I'm going to show it to my ladies. I'm going to show it to the women. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them say, oh, and by the way, and by the way, I'm going I'm to use Mary, and I'm going to use Elizabeth, and I'm going to use Mary Magdalene. I'm going to use all these women that, that people would have never thought. Jesus just disrupts the first culture, the first century culture as it pertains to, to this systematic inequality. And he goes on to this, he, when demons are there, they're like, ah, you know, like, Jesus is here. And, you know, and, and, they, and they start bartering with him because they know they're not going to be able to maintain where they were once before. He disrupts disease. When illness is in the house, it, it starts to, like, cower. Jesus is like, you got to go. So he started healing all sorts of people. We, we believe that we've been seeing in our time and place Jesus killed cancer. I'm not talking about like back then. I'm talking about right now. Let me just bring you current to the disruption that Jesus continues to do. Jesus is a cancer killer. He's an addiction killer. He's a wall killer between churches. He's a racism killer. He's that continual systematic inequality killer. Jesus continues to disrupt our current kingdoms to bring his own kingdom. Amen? All right. Beginning in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Stop. This is Paul, the apostle who used to be Saul. So if you came in here and you've got like a rough past that you're not sure you'd want anyone to know, you're in amazing company, okay? Because this dude Saul was somebody that, that would, as he would persecuted us like to the point of death, okay? And so if you've got stuff about your past that you come in and you're always like, man, I hope nobody to ask me like a second or third level question about what's been going on or, or where I've been. Listen, you're in good company. The gospel invites you to come as well because Saul, he, he was that. And then it became Paul. And he was, this, he was this amazing dude who was incredibly weak and broken and needy of Jesus. And yet Jesus used him to start all these churches, like, like in all these different places. He was an apostle because that means one cent. And so Jesus churned his life around. He, he, gave him, he gave him the ability to understand himself as a sinner and in need of Jesus. Paul did that. And then, and then Jesus was like, I'm not just going to save you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to call you to this really great work. And so Paul is writing, and he's writing Timothy, this guy that he's kind of adopted almost as his, as his spiritual son. 
as the one that he's trying to empower. Paul now begins to see his, well, he, hasn't, he doesn't begin. He's been seeing his success as uh, defined by how successful Timothy is. It's like, as Timothy goes, so does Paul. It's, it's almost like they had that type of deep connection. And it wasn't like Paul was over here saying, well, as long as I have my stuff together and I'm growing in Christ, things are good. No, no, that was important to Paul. But what was also important to Paul was how was Timothy doing? It was like they were so connected, and I don't mean in a weird, like, like um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Co-dependent way. I mean in a, like, gospel-saturated way. Where, where Paul had this deep love for Timothy, and he began to define his own success as how well Timothy was doing. And, and he actually writes to Timothy, and he cares about Timothy, and he pours into Timothy from a jail. This is considered to be Paul's last letter. So if you know anything about Paul, he wrote a ton of the New Testament. This is his last letter and before he dies. And he's in jail, and he writes with a sense of urgency, like, man, i got to tell you this stuff. It's almost like Paul knows it's getting close. And he writes with the sense of urgency. And, and this is, if you will, sort of, the, that, that's, we look at the elements of different empowerment. The reason we're looking at some of these elements is because it's like Paul saying, man, this is my last shot, so listen up. And so Avenue Church, man, we just want to listen up to Paul as he pours into Timothy, this young guy who struggled with some fear and anxiety. So this is what he continues to say uh, at verse 10 in which now before the ages began, in which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Hey, um, you've heard this word gospel here. I've got to put my finger right here, or I'm going to forget where I was reading. You've heard this word thrown around a couple times now. Let me just tell you, the good news of Christ is that no matter who you are and what you've brought in, you, you are, you're born into this world apart from a holy and righteous God. But the good news is that holy and righteous God, he, he had this like love affair that we would have called um, scandalous because he chose you and he chose me. He went after the wrong person, really. He went after, he went after the, the corrupt and the dirty and, and the person who didn't want him. Like God gave himself for us. And the way he gave himself for us is he's like, listen, I gotta punish you. Like, I've got to crush you for eternity in hell. Like, that's what we all deserve. That's how we were born, and that's what we get good at, just living life apart from a holy God. But God's like, I can't, man, I, I am so in love with these people that I'm going to pursue them at great expense to myself. And then Jesus shows up, God the Son, and Jesus goes to a cross. Here's the good news, is that people just like me and you, man, we, we, don't, we don't have to stay in that condition separated from God, that we can look to the cross of Christ for our forgiveness, for our redemption. Because God the Son went to a cross and he took your sin and mine and he was crushed in our place. He died the death that you and I should have died and then on the third day he overcame our sin. He overcame our death. And God who is righteous does not need to punish sin twice because he's already punished it in Christ. If we receive that, by faith in what Christ has done for us, and by simply turning our lives over to him as our Lord, we are forgiven of our sin, we are adopted, and we begin that journey of freedom and power into doing what you actually want and were created to do. That's the gospel, and it's an invitation to all of you to come to Jesus by faith and receive that. That's what changed Timothy, that's what changed Paul, and that's what motivates this whole letter who abolished death, which means now death no longer has a hold on us. We will die physically, but it's simply, as I was reading this morning, a graduation ceremony into the life that we are really desiring with Christ, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which we were appointed, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, this is Paul telling Timothy, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until the day that has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you, Timothy. So Timothy's got some work to do. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus, Hermogenes, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onsiphorus, for he refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. 
and you know well all the service he rendered at Ephesus. This is the word of the Lord. Now, what are we to take from this portion of the letter? What are, what are, what are we to, to now change about our thinking as it pertains to God's word and how we empower others? Remember, we said this last week, th- this series um, is about in- empowerment, and, it, and it's, it's going to speak first to Timothy's, I'm sorry, first to Paul's, and then to Timothy's. And so to, to the Pauls, to those of you who are, who, are, who are ready to pour into others, who are desirous of that, what are some of the things that we can learn about this particular element of empowering relationships? The first one is this, share in sufferings. Share in sufferings for the gospel. You have a, uh, an outline, and um, I encourage you guys to, to check it out, and, and this is kind of what I'll, what I'll be using to, to work through some of the notes. Share in sufferings for the gospel by the power of God. This is a rather unusual invitation. This is, a, this is, a, this is kind of like a, a radical, uh, interesting, awesome, provocative invitation. Paul is inviting young Timothy not to a life of comfort or convenience or ease. He, he's inviting him into suffering. That's kind of an interesting invitation, right? Right? Like most of you, when you want somebody to do something or go somewhere with you, you don't sell the bad, you sell the good, correct? Like if you're going to go on a road trip with my family and I, I'm not going to tell you about the chaos you're getting ready to enter into with the three and four-year-old and the questions and the, and the food that's going to come at you and the, and the, you know, like the back of the seat stuff and the fact that you might get an elbow on my way back to one of them. I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm going to tell you about how scenic it's going to be to take the long way with us. Here's what Paul does. He's like, you're, like, I'm suffering, and so there's an element to the gospel which requires you to suffer. I want to invite you into that. It's a rather unusual um, invitation. It reminded me of, of this invitation right here. Um, you thought that ball had more air in it. So did I. Anyway, so, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, promposals. Anybody familiar with a prom proposal? I wasn't familiar with it either, either until my daughter turned 17 and somebody asked her to the prom. Yeah, really sweet. <laughs> Super awesome. Okay, so um, anyways, there's these, there's these ways that people invite people. To, now they're called prom proposals and they're kind of like a big deal. And, and um, people, it's, you know, like it was a big deal for me to ask my wife to marry her. That was like a proposal. And, and so this is... A promposal, I don't like the sound of it from the beginning. Anyways, this is what it says. Caroline, I would dig it if we went to prom together. <laughs> oh, that's super sweet. Get that out of here. <laughs> Listen. Unusual invitation, right? Unusual invitation. He was a really sweet dude. He was a really sweet dude. Unusual invitation. Paul is inviting Timothy into something that for many of us, might feel unusual. Wait a minute. You're talking about forgiveness, you're talking about freedom, and you're talking about power. You haven't mentioned suffering. But, but when you say yes to Jesus, you actually say yes to the sufferings that go along with Jesus. Let me be clear about the gospel. The good news is that now you are not only free and powerful to do what you want, you are actually free and powerful to now suffer well. Because suffering is very much a part of the Christian life. Let me say that again. Suffering is very much a part of the Christian life. What it means to follow Jesus, there is a great theme of suffering. Let's not forget that the hero of our story dies a horrific death on a cross. There's resurrection in the midst of that. But they're suffering along the way. And so if you are suffering for the sake of the gospel, if you have put yourself out there and now are feeling the pain of what it means to say no to the flesh or, or to lose parts of the world that you used to have or to feel the oppressive attacks of the enemy, let me say that that is very normal and invite you to continue to suffer well for the sake of the gospel. I love this invitation because it gives us, um, it like gives us the opportunity for more. I feel like we want more, that we love uh, more. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, I have a, I have a, a buddy of mine, and, and I'll reference him much through this series, and uh, his name is Dan 
And he's the one who has walked with me for 18 years and helped to empower me. And much of what I've learned about empowerment has come through him. And, and there will be often times when I will sit together with Dan at 1.30 on Wednesday afternoon, and I will tell him kind of about my sufferings. And I will tell him about what is happening to us. Now, uh, I, I don't know if I'm fully correct on this, but this is just kind of some of the things that I've been thinking about. The American church doesn't suffer like the church in China or like the church in other countries where the persecution is very evident and outward. But I believe that there is, there is suffering that happens in the American church that, that is inward, that is unseen, that is, that is part of um, trying to walk in faith in the gospel. I feel like we, we receive attacks that may come in the form of depression or anxiety or whatever, whatever the case may be. And, 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 I, and I know that I understand mental illness, and I, I understand all those things, and I'm not calling all mental illness attack. I'm just saying, when, when you're trying to walk out your faith, it's not unopposed. It will be opposed, and many times we will feel that on the inside. And so I'll, I'll be telling him about some of the ways that I've been walking and just kind of some of the ways that I've just felt oppressed. And, and, and one of the best ways that he can comfort me is not to tell me it's going to be okay. I don't know, I, I don't, sometimes I need to hear it's going to be okay. And sometimes, you know, there's, there's parts of it where, where that, that's comforting and, and all those sorts of things. Here, here's what, like, does it for me. When, when he looks at me and he just speaks right into me, and, and he's like, well, what did you expect? Like, soldier up, man. Keep going. The suffering is signs that you are in a place that is right, good, and healthy. You keep going. There is something inside of me that comes to life that cannot come to life outside of being called to suffer well. It's like the Lion of Judah comes out and roars in those moments because I want more. I want to follow Christ. You want to follow Christ as the Spirit of God lives within you. And sometimes we just need people to come alongside us and invite us to suffer well because this life, this side of heaven, is broken and is difficult and will require suffering at times. The second thing that we see here is a holy calling. Man, man not only do we need a catalyst to help us suffer well, but we also need to be reminded of a holy calling. He hasn't just saved us, but he's also called us. So, so in the scriptures it says that you've been saved, but then, Timothy, you've also been called. And what's really important for us, if we're going to begin empowering other people, is not only to be a catalyst that they would suffer well, but also that, that we would remind them that they've been called to something, that we would know people well enough to know, hey, I know your gifts, I know your life, I know who you are, and this is a calling for you. You've not just been saved, but you've been called. We need people to help us identify our callings in life. And so uh, what you should understand is that we believe in full-time ministry, but we believe that we're all in full-time ministry. And so sometimes you just need somebody to come alongside you and remind you, moms who might be at home all day with your children, that that is a radical gospel calling, that you have been set aside for this time and this season to, to pursue that as a divine calling from God, just like the teachers in the house have been called and set aside to to, to bring the gospel to bear in their context, just like the accountants have, just like the plumbers have, that, that we have a calling in our life, and we should look around ourselves and believe that every moment is actually packed with divine significance if we have eyes to see, and oftentimes somebody to help us, empowered for the moment. Finally, guard the good deposit. Guard the good deposit. You see, here's, here's the situation. Paul was asking Timothy to do hard things. He was inviting Timothy to do hard things, and we actually love to do hard things because the image of God and the Spirit of God loves to experience more of God. And so when you call somebody to do hard things like suffer well, if the Spirit of God lives in them, a lot of times that Spirit will come out and roar and respond in a, like a really beautiful way. And so the final thing here is that, that Timothy was supposed to guard the good deposit that there, this is going to be like dual action for Timothy. It's not just do hard things because Timothy's responsibility was for several churches in his area. He had to manage all sorts of like drama and, and new churches. and all so, he, Timothy was sent to this particular area. Who was, he was very timid. He was a dude that dealt with some fear. And he was supposed to step into a lot of like churches and new churches trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And here's what Paul says. Guard the good deposit. 
There's some dual responsibility here by the Holy Spirit. And this is how Paul says he does it. For I know whom I have believed, and I, now I'm convinced. Paul's like, this is how I do it. I know how, whom I have believed. I think it's verse 12. And then later he says, now I'm convinced. So the way that Timothy and the way that we're going to help others to guard the good deposit is by reminding them in whom they have believed. Because the more you get to know your Redeemer, Jesus, the easier it is to get behind him and start to feel safe enough to do disruptive things. And start to feel safe enough to do disruptive things. Because if you're not safe in the gospel, you'll be bad disruptive. You won't be gospel disruptive. But when you begin to understand how safe you are in the gospel, then you begin to move into spaces where you might open your home and say yes to foster children where you might begin to do things that disrupt the status quo because of how safe you are in Christ. But the problem is you're not going to get there without somebody else coaching that into you. It's just not going to happen on your own. And so as I'm going to ask Austin to, to come on up, and we're going to prepare to close. There's, there, there's some elements that I'm going to leave you with as, as he gets ready to play our, our final song that... Um, Man, I think are so important for us as we think to give these away to those around us. These, these are what they are, briefly, specific. Elements of empowering invitation. When you're asking people to do hard things, be specific about it. Paul was specific to Timothy. He says this, Timothy, suffer well for the gospel by the power of God. And then he's talking to Timothy about his, his surroundings. He knows that Timothy's going to have to suffer in order to do his job. So when we are looking out to other people and we're trying to empower them, be specific about the suffering we're calling them to. Be specific about the hard thing we're going to call other people into. Don't just say, you know, keep going for Jesus. No. Like, hey, hey, you. Like, you should go back to school. Hey, you, you should finish that degree. Hey, you, you should get some training in that area. Hey, you, you should give yourself at great expense to fill in the blank. Hey, you, we're doing something radically special with Kingdom Kids, and we are understaffed. Hey, you, in this, give, give us a Sunday a month to come in and, and, and be disruptive over there as we disrupt the status quo of what churches normally do. Specific. The second one is gospel-inspired. Like, let's not inspire one another out of guilt or fear. Let's not move forward in a scarcity mentality. Let's move forward in an abundance mentality. Do you know my, my, my wife and I opened our home to, to foster? It wasn't because we, we knew all the stats about foster care that broke our hearts, although that is true, and it is heartbreaking. We decided to do something what we felt was kind of dangerous to the status quo of what we had because we felt we had so much in Christ. It wasn't because there was so little out there. It was because there was so much in here. We felt safe enough to be disruptive. When you empower other people from the gospel, you move forward in a theme of abundance in Christ, not scarcity in the outside. And people start to get crazy disruptive. Make it impossibly possible. Nobody wants to do the status quo. As we empower other people, call them to the impossible. Go ahead. Let them understand themselves as, as apostles and evangelists in very secular places and let them let, let, encourage them into those relationships that seem impossibly possible only in Christ. Believe in them before they believe in themselves. Let them know that the Holy Spirit lives within them and that they can do far more than they ever thought or dreamed and make sure that as you invite people to do hard things, just make sure it's compelling compel them in such a way because you yourself are walking and modeling the same things. You see, a culture of empowerment, it not only knows its bench, it knows what's next for its bench. It knows what's next for the people they're empowering. And so as we sing this last song, we just want to pray that God would fill us with his Holy Spirit, that he would empower us to be a culture that actually gives that away and becomes radically disruptive to this area and beyond. Amen. Father, fill us with your spirit now, and may we in worship declare these good things, these truths about you. Would you shift and rearrange us in the midst of singing out to you? And would you accomplish things that we cannot accomplish on our own? 
for the good of others and your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. Now may the God who promises that as we come to him over and over and over again, we will not be shaken. May that God give you the foundation that can only be found in Christ through faith in his finished work, through repentance, through understanding Christ as our treasure. May that God build a firm foundation in you that you give away over and over and over again to the Timothys around you. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Love you guys.